The metaphor of the inward and outward journey is very important as we examine the season of Lent and we reflect on the inward obstacles that beset us in our spiritual journey. As we make new choices, not only glorify God, but live our life as a rich blessing every single day. It's a season where there is hope for a new direction, a new set of choices, a new beginning. As we read the Gospel today, Jesus is in his final weeks on his way to Jerusalem. As he walks, he's aware of a history that all the prophets of the past who made their way to Jerusalem were either ignored, persecuted, or assassinated. The evidence is in Jeremiah 26 and Jeremiah 38. Jesus is considering these passages, and he knew, he knew, he knew that he would end up exactly with the same fate. I want you to consider for a moment what it would be like if you knew exactly how your life in this world would end. If you knew when, you knew how, and you knew why, how would your life change? How would your approach to life change? Jesus made his way towards Jerusalem. He was also aware of an enemy. One of his many was Herod. He liked to refer to him as that fox. The Herods of Jesus' kingdom were many. There had been a Herod reigning when he was born, and that Herod didn't get rid of him. There was another Herod now, and he knew he wouldn't be able to get rid of him. That vindictive, violent, vicious bully would not be able to stop the will of God. I would propose this morning that there is a chance that you have in your life a vicious, vindictive, violent bully. You need to, start to know today that that bully will not stop the will of God in you. They are powerless before the throne of grace. Jesus knew he would die in the holy city, that that was part of God's plan, not Herod's gods, not a vicious, vindictive, violent little bully. But from the throne of grace, there would be a sacrifice made. And Jesus knew he was called to be that sacrifice. He knew that for years, the prophets had been reminded to tell the kings of their duty to the covenant with God, and they had ignored it. But there was something new, something different in the atmosphere. Jesus was hearing conversation in the corners of the city. He knew there was a new spirit and a new willingness to embrace the kingdom of God. That there was a growing number of people who wanted a vision of justice and righteousness in the kingdom. But he also knew that God would have to do something new. It had been predicted in Isaiah 43 that God would need to do something new through him. I would propose this morning that God is waiting to do something new through you. But we need to make a choice. Will we be a bitter people or a better people? Today, in Luke 13, there is a reference to God gathering the children like a hen gathers the brood under her wings. And I'd like to talk to you about that for a minute. 
I need you to know that when there is a fire in the farmyard, farmers have consistently discovered mother hens tucked in a corner of the burnt out barn. The hens themselves roasted beyond recognition. But underneath, the live babies still in her care. This image goes back thousands of years. The mother sacrificing her life for the live babies underneath. This image of a hen brooding over the babies is a powerful one running all the way through the Old Testament and New Testament. For there is a reference in Genesis 1 to Jesus himself with God the Father brooding over creation, watching it, observing, listening. And then in the New Testament, several references to the brooding of God, even grieving the loss of Jerusalem, a deep and profound sense of their sad history, and redemption being on the edge of a new beginning. The Hebrew word is brooding. Brooding over the waters, brooding over the people, waiting to gather us under God's wing and to protect us from everything that would ensnare us. You and I live in a world obsessed with status and power. Jesus was no stranger to politics. He would say things like, the first will be last and the last will be first. And if we understood the depths of those words, we know why the status quo politicians of his time were so furious with him. Because the translation goes like this, be aware be aware that those who are on top in comfortable positions may not end up there in the end. God has influence. Influence over the ballot box. Influence over the lives that are in control of us. God changes things in God's own time. I love this part of the passage. You need to be a little careful who your friends are. The Pharisees approached Jesus, and they got a long history of being unkind. But they come and they say, you need to get out of here because Herod wants to kill you. You know, at face value, it looks like Jesus has a whole new set of friends. This usually happens when somebody wins a lottery. They have a whole new set of friends until the money is gone. This will happen if you are elected to some position of influence. Suddenly you have a whole new set of friends that might want something from you. This happens even in situations in the church. You know what I mean. It looks like the Pharisees are trying to help Jesus get out of town before Herod comes to you, but here's the truth. If Jesus left that geographical area, he would be entering into the area of Pilate, who was waiting. <coughs> waiting to find out some kind of trump charges to get rid of Jesus. We all know in the end that's part of what happened. Be careful who your friends are. If they are suddenly wanting to help you but have a long history of not helping, it's worth some prayer and reflection before you jump into a new situation. It's a little, oh, one of those that makes your stomach turn a bit. Jesus is healing and casting out demons. And the politicians are profoundly intimidated, not that he's healing and casting out demons, but that he's challenging the status quo. You see, if we keep doing things the way we always have, they will always turn out the way they have, and we won't be challenged to consider anything new. But I've got to tell you, the famous, 
famous and favorite image in this passage is the one about the fox. We need to watch for the fox. In Hellenistic thought, the fox is regarded as a clever, shy, unprincipled creature. The fox is the one who sneaks in in the night and takes what is ours. We need to watch for the fox. Jesus' hope for Jerusalem was that they would repent and that somehow the imagery of finding shelter under the wings of God that we see in Deuteronomy and Ruth and the Psalms would be that people would discover that our Lord and Savior was the one who would be the new head of humanity. For Jesus, he knew that the hope and the dream, the drive and the determination was to gather God's people into his embrace. For Luke, who wrote all of this, it's simple and it's straightforward, and it's about choosing between bitterness and better. Yes. You see, now I have your attention. I violated the English language. It's choices between being bitter or better, and it's a choice that we make every single day where we choose to be better in our faith in Christ or bitter with a broken and shattered world. If we choose to be better in Christ, then we become agents of his love and grace and change in the world around us. For Luke's dream was that lives would change, that the societies would be transformed, and there would be personal and social transformation through Christ and those who believed in him. Every one of us has a choice today. It's a choice to leave here with a renewed hope that you know that you are one of those babies that is gathered under the wings of God to protect you and nurture you and carry you and protect you from the fires of destruction, dismay, discouragement, and depression. To gather you as the beloved and keep you safe in his love. Then, as you grow and learn to be able to set you free from underneath the wings to be agents of that love and grace in the lives of others. But the choice is, will we be bitter or will we be better in our faith in Christ? Amen.